Mort Darter. Or Morty Darter, however you want to say it. Probably if you want to be more correct, you probably go with the first pronunciation. Um, this is by Sir Thomas Mallory. Uh, he's widely credited with being, uh, you know, the, the main uh, the, the main forefather of King Arthur legend. Uh, the little bit of background that we have in the book, it's kind of interesting to, to note that he wrote this. Uh, probably wrote it from behind bars while he was arrested um, and uh, in prison. And uh, they were, as it said, you know, they were given certain luxuries and books, and so he could read about all of these tales and translate them and kind of put a, a compilation together of a kind of the, the greatest hits. Um, as we've talked a lot about chivalry and about knights representing Arthur, here's a story of Arthur and, spoiler alert, his death. Hopefully you could figure that out from the root of uh, Morte. Um, and uh, I was only in Spanish in that Morte. Um, so I would imagine the root for French is very similar as well. Um, but uh, interesting about Mallory, he was the one really credited with putting it down kind of in print and uh, keeping it together. Uh, fact about down at the very bottom of that, talking about uh, a printer press, uh, 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 William with a Caxton. Uh, you know, after Mallory died, he kind of put it together and put it out there and so that it, it stayed what it was. It was like a, a William Shakespeare's works really weren't bound and compiled together until after he died, when all of his friends and people who were around, they wrote down what they remember the play being from their brilliant memories and any scraps of paper they had and put all of his sonnets and everything together and they published the folio of Shakespeare. And some of those folios that are still you know, around are just very, very, very valuable, obviously. Um, but anyways, this is our last uh, foray into uh, Camelot and Arthur. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a, it's a lot uh, of action as opposed to some of our other stuff was more uh, the moral of the tale, like with the wife of Bath and that night, okay, that we talked about. Um, but here we have, we see King Arthur. We still focus a lot on the chivalry and being loyal to your king. You do what he asks. Um, they have a huge battle. Arthur, you know, I'm not spoiling anything, he's on his deathbed and he requests his lone surviving knight to do something. I want you to be able to find out what that thing is that he asks and whether the knight does it or not. And what does that say about his character? What does it say about his connection with the king? Good. And not just his connection with the king, but you know how they've lived their life and their their schooling throughout life was for you know these moments and for their future was all about the king. So when we see the very, very end of this and the way that it wraps up for Sir Bedivere, who is the, the remaining knight, you will hopefully see, wow, this is a great representation of what the code of knighthood and chivalry really stands for, which is the essence of our time in this piece. So I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's a lot, it's pretty graphic, uh, especially once we get to the battle. So I hope uh, you are pretty uh, comfortable with that. It's a little bit different than what uh, we have had up till now. So very, uh, very graphic. Uh, take a look at the very top before we start. Um, it's important to understand, especially when we have little paragraphs that are summarized, a lot of stuff's happening. And if you look here, we are introduced to a character named Lancelot. Um, we haven't had him actually mentioned in our different nights up until now, but I think he's the most famous one. I, when I hear a Camelot, I always think of Arthur and Lancelot. Um, and so Lancelot, the story is that he got a little chummy chummy little close with the queen. Well, that probably isn't a good job security move, okay? And so actually Lancelot and his followers have fled. Arthur is in pursuit. And as he leaves, there's nobody there to take uh, to keep control of England. And so that's where we're introduced to another character. And if you look down there, it's called Mordred, who is the illegitimate son, which means not from wedlock, um, of Arthur takes the throne. So while Arthur's away, he needs to come back and fight for his throne and uh, get the usurper out of the way and uh, ultimately reign and control. Okay, so that's the backstory, the premise. That's why Arthur isn't in England right now, and he's coming back. And in his coming back, we start right away. He starts to have a dream that has a vision. We are introduced, not introduced, reintroduced to Sir Gawain or Gowan. Um, you know, we find out that he is actually a relative of Arthur, and he has died. And so when Arthur actually sees him and talks to him, uh, there's a, that kind of supernatural element 
uh, foreshadowing, foreboding, maybe, of what could come uh, in the future. And he's very much warning Arthur, um, do not go into battle. A bad thing will happen to you. And based on the title of this and what I've already let you know, led you down that path, I think we can figure out whether he follows it or not. So some new characters are introduced as well as some old favorites and classics. So make sure we keep them, keep them separate. All right, more theater, okay? Um, <clears throat> as I said in the preface before we started, the introduction, uh, I wanted you to look out for a, uh, a few things, specifically the end with Bedivere and whether he stays loyal and honest to his king, which I think we can quickly say, uh, well, ultimately he does. Um, but leading up to that, it starts to make you question it. Um, you know, he flat out lies to him a couple times. Um, and that probably it is vastly against the programming of a knight to, uh, to deceive that one person that, uh, in essence, is kind of their god. Um, that they want to uh, to please all the time. Um, so go back to the beginning of this uh, of this story, please. Um, and again, just to quickly rehash, he is out of the country. He because he's off. Arthur is chasing Lancelot. Um, you know, upset at his romances with uh, with his wife, which I think most people probably would have some anger. But while he's gone, his illegitimate son Mordred takes over the throne, and so Arthur has to come back in order to fight. Um, but as we see this first uh, first part, he starts to have this dream where he's uh, he falls into this, these snakes and they just grab on him and pull on him. Oh, and then he wakes up from this, from this nightmare. And so knowing ultimately what causes the fighting and war, um, being one little adder, one little serpent, one little snake comes out and bites somebody, you can kind of see how his dream was a little bit prophetic, you know, pointing out uh, what is going to happen. Um, so on the next page, uh, you know, he sees Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain, uh, his nephew, um, which I think when we did Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, we weren't necessarily aware that that was their family connection. Um, you know, so this comes to light in this particular tale. Uh, surrounded by a, a lot of women come to him, and uh, that's a little weird because I know that uh, you're dead, Gawain. Why are you talking to me? And he says that God has sent me back with this message. God is concerned about you, that you will die this next day, and uh, if you seek out Mordred and fight. Um, and so what you need to do is, here, get Mordred to have a ceasefire. Have you heard of ceasefires in the news lately uh, pertaining to military conflicts and people, they might ceasefire for Christmas, or they might ceasefire for, for 24 hours so that we can hopefully peacefully negotiate something and then game on again. It's very similar to that here, um, and say so you need to pause him a month. You need to stall, stall him a month, so that Lancelot, who you were chasing, he's been told that he needs to come back and help you, and he is because as a knight, you are very loyal, and you will put aside differences to do what is right and what you're supposed to do. And so Lancelot could be back in a month, and then you can battle him. So I need you to send somebody to take care of. So. Thank goodness for this prophecy, but based on the title and how we saw it play out, Arthur dies, so he doesn't fully follow it. He kind of half does it. He puts the ball in play to stall. So good job, way to follow these omens and this, uh, this dream of yours. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the page, he has dispatched somebody to offer him lands in order to stall, because Mordor's like, why should I? Oh, you're going to give me these things with a promise of after your death, I can have England all? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I will give you a month. That's a pretty good deal. So he uh, is actually up on the situation. Um, you know, he is given Kent and Cornwall, so these two areas of, of England, and with the promise of being become king after Arthur dies. Um, but if you pay attention there at the bottom, um, actually the top of the next page, it says that when Arthur was getting ready to depart, because they were going to send Arthur and Mordred, they're going to have a small group, what was it, 14, I think, were going to have this little meeting, probably to seal the deal, and just to make sure. But before Arthur left, he said, make sure that you keep an eye out. If you see somebody draw their weapon for whatever reason, it's on. Okay? 
I don't want to be lulled into a trap, a trick. I want you to be on guard. And conversely, Mordred told his people the exact same thing. Um, uh, da, da, da. And likewise, Sir Mordred warned his host that, and ye see any manner of sword drawn, look that he come on fiercely. So imagine he's going to be coming at you. So slay all that ever before you standeth. So both sides are on pins and needles, okay? One false move on either side could tip the scales, and we are at war. And Mordred had 100,000, I mean, they're ready for war, okay? This is huge. This isn't some little 14 versus 14 battle. This is big, okay? And so things play out where we have uh, the, that adder, that presence of the serpent that we alluded to earlier, comes out and just bites somebody. So, ah, stupid snake. Oops, what did I draw? What did I fling around? What caught the light and everybody saw it? And even everybody doesn't need to see it. Just one person. Because they all have their orders from their king or person in charge. So all of a sudden, that one drawn sword, all of a sudden, it's game on. And there is a huge battle and a huge fight and a huge war. Um, it's similar if you if you saw the Lord of the Rings two towers the middle one they're having this big battle at Helm's Deep all of the orcs are coming up to this impenetrable fortress and all of the elves and people are behind the wall and they just stop and they're looking and it starts to rain and it's nighttime it's just a really cool thing and so then they draw their bows and they're just waiting to start and this old man can't hold it anymore and he lets go and it goes and kills an orc and game on. It starts. It's just, I mean, they were going to fight anyways. They weren't offering peace, so it's not quite the same. But the visual should be very similar. Um, and so the battle plays out. And, and scroll down the rest of that page there. Um, they talk about that there was never a more doleful battle on no Christian land. All the rushing and riding and lunging around. Arthur, being the king and the bravest, he was flying through the battle left and right. And, and then he bust through the other side, and he turned around and go right back in, and he kept fighting. Even Mordred, his illegitimate son, wasn't a coward about it. They weren't hiding in the back, hoping that the battle doesn't come to them, and so they were fighting and fighting. Eventually, long story short, everybody's dead. We have Arthur, okay, who, fu who fights uh, in a little bit, but Arthur and his two knights, okay, we have uh, Lucan and, uh, and his brother Bedivere, Okay. In essence, that's their names. You don't need their title, the butcher, and all that. So uh, we have Luke and, and Bedivere, uh, both uh, hurt in battle. Okay, And uh, Arthur is really upset. Look at all of my knights. Everybody that followed me is dead because of that prayer, my illegitimate son. And they look and they see him standing over a pile of dead bodies leaning on his sword. Now, is he leaning there mockingly like, I doubt it. Just his presence, that he is the last one alive. Arthur wants to go get him. But all of a sudden, we got to remember this prophecy. Don't fight him. The battle's already happened. You miraculously have survived. But don't fight him today, and you'll survive. So just wait. But of course, he's so impassioned about it. He gets his spear, and he starts running at them. Look, uh, the, 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 the next page there, uh, for us, uh, 189. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Where are we? Then the king got his spear halfway through the page, in both his hands, and ran towards Mordred, crying and saying, Traitor, now is thy death day come. So as Arthur spoke, Mordred turns around, okay, and Arthur takes his spear and jams it underneath the shield into the body. Good, that's a mortal wound. And I think we've seen this. If you've seen war movies, action movies, a big hulking people, that blade, that spear goes into him. And Arthur is still too far away from Mordred to do anything. So Mordred throws himself onto that spear even further so you can see it coming out the back. And he pushes himself along the spear. So he's put, you know, remember Olaf and Frozen? Oh, I'm impaled. Right? And he pulls himself through. You know what I'm talking about. It's a great movie, by the way. Um, so he pulls himself, in essence, pulls himself onto the spear until he gets to the hilt, the handle, and then he takes his sword, crack, right down on, on Arthur. It goes through the, 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 the helmet, into the skull, and pokes the brain, which is a, just a 
wonderful image if you can imagine. So the writing is wonderful. Um, a lot more graphic than some of those other pieces we've had. Um, I don't know how Arthur, based on what we know of warfare, how he doesn't die at that moment. But once the sword comes down, Mordred falls limp to the, you know, he died. But a very kind of heroic, I'm going to go, you know, I'm not just going to see blood and fall down dead, pulls and pales himself even further and then, you know, comes cracking down. Um, good. So they're whisked away. Uh, the two knights come up, grab the mortally wounded Arthur and take him off the field. And while they're away, they hear this noise out on the field. Okay? And hopefully, that, I mean, that, the whole war is disturbing, but to think about these people, these robbers and pillagers are walking around the corpses and taking off, you know, rings, not watches, but, you know, rings and medals and all of these things. They're, they're scavengers. Okay? And you hear screaming. Well, that's not the, the pillagers. Who was making all those noises? What were they doing to people that were still alive out there? I start to pull off my ring. I'm going to fight you if I'm still alive. If I'm still alive. So I'm in no mood to fight. And so they probably can easily just do what? Yeah. Haven't you seen this before in movies and TV and war? People walk around the field just to check and make sure people are dead. And so you hear the dying anguish groans out there as they're being finished off. So a real horrible vision. And he sent Lucan out there to see it. And Lucan is mortally wounded, as we see in just a little bit. And so he comes back and says, we need to move. We need to get you out of here. Because imagine if those people found the king over there. I'm sure he has some things, of, especially the sword, things of worth. And his life would be in jeopardy even more so than it is with a sword out of the head. I'm sure they've taken it out, but still. We can imagine the visual. Um, and so they take him away. And in lifting up Arthur, Arthur swoons. And Lucan pretty much falls down because all of his guts come out, which is just a, if you've seen like Jurassic Park stuff, when a philosopher after rips somebody, or Luke Skywalker takes the, you know, or actually it's Han, takes Luke's lightsaber to the Tauntaun, and the guts come flying out. Really gross, but kind of neat because we haven't had any of this up till now. Everything is so moral to the story. Now we have a little gore if that's, if that interests you. If not, yeah, just ignore it. I like it. Um, and so anyways, uh, they, uh, the guts fall out, Lucan falls dead, and Arthur in essence says, you know what, I really deserve, this man deserves my emotions and I should feel bad for him, which I do because I know you guys are brothers, but I'm on death's door as it is and I'm going to die soon, so um, here's what I need you to do. Take my sword, Excalibur, and throw it into the lake. Bedivere takes the sword, gets ready, and man, that's a really nice sword. He doesn't throw it. He hides it. Now, does he hide it because he wants to sell it and pawn it and get a lot of money? Or does he want it because he can be king? and all? These? I don't think that's necessarily the thing. If we looked at the lines, it just talked about there is such a, this is such a wonderful sword. Why would we throw it away that no one can view it anymore? And so that's a problem. So he hides it. He goes back. You're going to die soon, King. Yes, I threw it for you. You lied to me. How does he know? Well, Arthurian legend says that he got the sword from the Lady of the Lake. Okay? I was doing some research on this before, and there are different stories that says Excalibur is also the name of the sword out of the stone. Others say that was a different sword, that only a true king can pull it out. And so he pulled it out, he's the king, and then the Lady of the Lake gives him Excalibur later. And so there's all these controversies about the, the true origin of it. But I think, the, especially with Mallory as being kind of the forefather, the, the big, like the Shakespeare of, of King Arthur, a lot of people believe that it is a separate sword. And so Excalibur came from the Lady of the Lake, so he knows that something magical happens when that sword's by the water. And so he calls Bedivere a liar and says, you go and do that again. You've dishonored me once. Go and do it one more time. Take it. And so he hides it a second time and comes back. Arthur says, you know what? I cannot believe that you are doing this to me. I'm on death's door, and you are taunting me by lying to me. And if I ever see you again, this life or the next, in essence, I'm going to kill you because you have dishonored me and tra you're a traitor to me because you want some pretty stones for yourself. Go back and do it. And so he finally goes, tosses it. And here's where something magically cool happens because Bedivere just thinks I'm going to toss it like you toss a rock out into the water and then, all right, well, there it is. Now I'm going to go. A hand shoots up out of the water, grabs it, 
That's weird. That normally doesn't happen. You don't see any head, you know, where you can catch like a baseball foul ball. You need to look for it. This arm just shoots up, grabs it, brandishes it, shakes it, what is it, three times? Three times, and then goes under the water. That's weird. And that's so weird and so supernatural and so exactly what Arthur expects. So when Better Beer comes back, says, you won't believe this, an arm shot up. Good, you've done what I've asked. You've done what I asked. And that the, the life cycle of that sword has come full circle. Okay, full circle, and it's back to where it came from, and so Arthur can die in peace. Okay, now uh, <coughs> jump to uh, bottom of 192. <coughs> the last couple paragraphs here. Bedivere and Arthur, after they've gotten through the, the lying and dishonesty, uh, he helps him up and out, and a boat shows up with a bunch of women on it. Very similar to the image from his dream with Sir Gawain. He gets on the boat. Okay, he gets on the boat, and if you look at the top of the next page, uh, he says to Bedivere, because Bedivere is, what should I do now? You're leaving me. I, what should I do? Where are you going? What's going on? And Arthur says to him, I must into the vale of Avilion to heal me of my grievous wounds. So the footnote says that Avilion is a legendary island where Arthur is said to dwell until his return. So they're going to take me to this magical place that will heal me from this stabbing of my brain and then he goes on to say and if thou never hear from me again pray for my soul so I'm probably going to die but this is where we're going to go they're gonna take me and try to fix me and all of that stuff okay and so that's the end of his king and he's crushed by it probably even more crushed because of his dishonesty and the parting thoughts you know you let down the man that you were supposed to lay your life on the line for and you did lay your life on the line but you let him down. Have your folks ever said to you, not only are they angry, but they're what with you? And that's the worst. I'm so disappointed in you. I'm just, I'm really just, you have let me down, and I don't know how long it'll take for you. That's worse than, than somebody being angry with you. And if you haven't experienced it yet, lucky you. Keep going with that. I doubt you'll keep it up, but everybody does something at some point that disappoints. Um, so anyways, they leave, they leave. Um, the last little thing that is of note is that we have um, uh, a scene with a hermit. A hermit is somebody who lives by themselves. Vedemir recognizes him as a former Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, that kind of sounds familiar, okay? Not the one who was martyred, but somebody else, okay? And uh, it, so it wasn't Thomas of Beckett. And so uh, he shows up, the hermit's on all fours, and there's a newly dug grave. Well, that's weird. Who's buried there? He asks the hermit. The hermit says, I don't know. A bunch of women showed up with a dead body. They gave me a bunch of tapers, a bunch of candles, and some money to bury him. Well, gee, who does that sound like? Well, that sounds like the guy just left, my king. You have King Arthur down there. Really? That's King Arthur. And I would like to stay with you, if you don't mind, hermit, because I know hermits like to be alone, but can I stay with you? And I'll take care of you, and I'll fast, and we can pray, and I never want to leave my king's side. All right, yeah, you can stay. So we see the loyalty, the dedication. Maybe we could say the idiocy. Your king's dead, move on. But you live your life for that person, and now this is a way to honor. Maybe this is his penance for being dishonest to his king. Maybe he feels that he has to protect him even in death. I don't know. But can we see that driving force, how he's you know, really going for his, uh, his, his loyalty and honesty and, and dedication to the king? Now look at the very bottom of 194, the second paragraph from the bottom. And it says, Thus of Arthur I find no more written in books. All of a sudden, we're done with the story. Now these words are, it is the author, Thomas, Sir Thomas uh, 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 Mallory. Is that us? No? Okay, good. We see uh, the words of Sir Thomas Mallory, where he says, I, I can't find any more. I've taken all of the information I've gotten, all the books, and if he truly was in jail, every account that I can find, and that's it. I put together the best work that I could. Even the archbishop couldn't really verify that it was Arthur. Maybe the head wound did it. Maybe he didn't know what Arthur actually looked like. I don't know. But it, as you see on the top of the next page, um, Sir Bedivere, a knight of the round table, made it to be written. So he's the one that, that kind of pushed for it to actually be Arthur. So, not be Arthur, like gold. Okay, that's a Golden Girls joke. Does anybody know Golden Girls? No? It was a show in the 80s. Anyways, pretty fun. Her name was B. Arthur. 
So uh, anyways, um, they didn't know that this actual corpse was Arthur. The, the, the uh, hermit couldn't really vouch for it. He's just going strictly on you know, what, what the knight said. And so Mallory's even saying that. You know, we're not quite sure because some people think that Arthur isn't even dead. Some people think that he's still on that island waiting to come back. That Excalibur was magical, that Arthur was almost godlike and couldn't be killed. Oh, he's coming back. He's coming back. The second coming of Arthur. He'll come at some point. And so some people believe that. So if you look at the incantation at the bottom, uh, Ic is set Arturus Rex Quandum Rex Quae Futurus. Here lies Arthur, who was once king and king will be again. Well, you don't see that king will be again hopeful for future on a lot of corpse, you know, uh, tombs and stuff. It's usually dead. Here lies the king, dead. And so a lot of people think that maybe this isn't Arthur. Maybe it's just the knight thinks and projecting that it is Arthur. I think we can all assume, based on the way the story was played out, there's probably not a woman, a lot of women walking around with a dead body. And so that probably was Arthur based on the, the structure of this story. But in the overall scope of Arthurian legend, people still hold out hope. And how can they hold out hope? Well, the guy buried him, and we're not digging him up. The guy buried him, he didn't know who it was. Maybe it's not him. Maybe he's out there. Those women took him. Maybe it's a different set of women. So there's, um, while it might not be realistic to think that there are several groups of women with dead bodies floating around, it probably was Arthur, uh, according to this piece. And what's interesting is uh, um, the women on the boat were actually identified by Mallory, not so much by Bedivere. The queen, his sister, uh, Queen uh, Morgan Le Fay, which is a, another famous, like Lancelot, a famous name, uh, and Merlin the magician, you know, wizard, that type of thing. Uh, the other two I hadn't heard of. The other was the Queen of North Gallus and the Queen of the Wastelands. And so he was like surrounded by royalty as they went off. Okay, I almost have this Viking image, you know, like Beowulf or somebody on a raft, you know, as you slowly go off to die, kind of just into the mist, into the gloom, just have that visual. Like, he really knew he wasn't going to come back, but, you know, if I don't come back, pray for me. Otherwise, I'm going to go try to get better. You almost wonder, you kind of knew you were going to die from that head wound. So there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, uh, myth, myths rolled into one, and Mallory really did his best to kind of give the biggest comprehensive summative piece of uh, Arthurian legend. Uh, and I uh, thought he did uh, pretty well. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Uh, it should, uh, should have read a lot different than some of the pieces we had earlier.